Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Lest we drift away. Whether pastor, deacon, church member, you name it, we can wander. Scary thought, but it's true. There is that principle of indwelling sin. And we need to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts and desires of the flesh. That's the battle. That's the battle. It was a wonderful service. I enjoyed the singing and fellowship. I'd like you to return again to the book of James. We've been in this book. I hope the book has been in us. It seems like every message has had something uh, uh, deeper beyond James's apparent simplicity. There's been much in the book of James. In, uh, in James 1, he told us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials and we learn the blessing of patience. In uh, chapter 2, we were told that faith without works is dead. It's, it's a confronting truth. That where there is true faith in Jesus Christ, uh, works are going to follow. Where there's regeneration, there's going to be a family likeness displayed. We're going to reflect somehow God's character in our lives. In James 3, we saw the contrast between earthly wisdom and divine wisdom. We saw that where there is envy, self-seeking, confusion, every evil thing exists. And to the contrary, God's wisdom is peaceful and it's righteous. And that we can have as much peace here as we will work towards, as we are committed to. James forewarned us not to boast about tomorrow. Now, I know that we plan for tomorrow, we plan for the weeks and months ahead, but we're never entirely certain we're going to have it. So our trust is in the Lord. And I want us to look today at the last few verses of James 5. And if I could put three words that describe this passage, it would be confess, pray, and restore. Confess, pray, and restore. James has just finished telling us about what happens when a believer is gravely ill and believes that, that God might extend their life for a season. And it does involve calling the church leaders and a time of anointing and prayer. And James moves on, it seems, from verse 16 uh, to continue to tell us about what church life is about. And it might surprise you. It might surprise you. Because uh, when believers get together, we sing songs together and we hear God's word together, and we hear a message, and we, we fellowship together. But James also tells us in verse 16 to confess trespasses to one another and to pray for one another that you may be healed. Uh, from time to time, from time to time, we need to make confession to one another. And, uh, and, and, and that confession uh, depends on who, who we may have offended, who we may have offended, how we offended them in words or in deeds. Can you remember the last time you confessed something to another believer? The last time. That says something. It says something. It's part of ordinary church life for us to confess our sins to each other. Not, not that we ultimately absolve each other. Only God can really and truly forgive us. But the truth is that if we are, if, if, if we are serving together, we're serving together, and we're seeing each other outside of church, and we, and we have meaningful relationships then that is going to involve a certain amount of friction. Now, if you want to treat churches like ships in the night, you know, in and out very quickly, 
and uh, we don't stay long enough to involve ourselves in each other's lives and to be with each other, that's one thing. But God tells us that we need to, from time to time, confess to one another. All right? Now, it, it doesn't mean that every week we have to all stand up and confess our pride. All right? Well, let's take that for granted. <laughs> take that for granted. Yeah? Um, but, but you know what I'm saying. There, things happen. Words are said. Words are said. People get overlooked. Get overlooked. And, and sometimes that can bother us and trouble us. And uh, yes, love covers, as we'll see, a multitude of sins. And our first impulse should be to overlook sins, overlook them, think the best in each other. But, but, but sometimes we just, we've got to raise things and we've got to confess things. And it's hard, it's painful, doesn't come naturally, doesn't come naturally. But James tells us that there is a place for that. And the truth is that when we confess our trespasses to one another, um, that usually breaks down many barriers. It almost always draws people closer together. Almost always. It might be that when we confess our trespasses to a person, it, it, it may well actually convict them of something they need to make right. Maybe, maybe. But a mature church learns how to confess how to confess I mean look if confession to God is rare these days then then confession to each other must be almost non-existent if people don't go to God they probably don't go anywhere else but when confession is made there is joy and there is restoration I, I came across this in a very extreme way in a very extreme way a number of years ago uh, when we were living up in Cairns and I was talking to some people who ran this sort of neighbourhood centre, neighbourhood centre, and they would bring people together that had, you know, the usual, you know, fence issues around neighbours and car accidents and you know, all these sort of things, and they would bring people together and they would uh, make things right and, you know, pay what they need to pay and, and people getting on much, much better. And, and, and they told us about a situation that they had been involved in of, 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 of reconciling some families. And it involved a fellow who, uh, who had decided somehow that, 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 that he was going to uh, burn, down, burn down a property to, to get a benefit out of, out of the insurance. Out of the insurance. Whether it was business or home, I can't remember the exact details. And, and he did set fire to the home. But, but amazingly, unbelievably, someone was inside the home when, it, when he set it on fire. And, and the person died. The person died, right? And, of course, he went to jail, went to jail. And he was there for a number of years and, uh, on all accounts, ha had dealt with his, his, his sin, his evil, and as he worked with, with the prison authorities, all, all he wanted to do was to, was to confess to this family and to seek, to seek their forgiveness. And, and, and that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. So here you have even, even, even an unsaved person realising that he had to seek forgiveness for something that he could never bring back. He could never bring that person back. Uh, well, I'm not expecting us to make those kind of confessions today, but uh, surely if we have you know, offended one another, there's, there's room at the cross. And James tells us to do this very thing, to confess, to pray, that you might be healed. And I think this is dealing with more of a, a spiritual restoration. That, that peace that comes in not having to avoid someone. Avoid someone. Confess. Confess. Well, James tells us in verse 16 that we also need to pray. We also need to pray. He says in verse number 16 that the, the, the effective, fervent prayer, this is prayer that, that it, it gets answered, it gets answered, and, and it's fervent. This is prayer that is often given to God. 
it's successful actually because it is fervent and because it is offered by a righteous man or woman. That's the thought here. Very effective because it's fervently offered to God from a person who is walking with God. This verse has been put this way. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so our prayer life is not just about what we ask and how often we ask, it's, it's, it's who are we? Who's asking? Who's asking for these things from God? If, if we're coming to our Heavenly Father, then we ought to be walking as obedient children, as obedient children. We ought to be following him and walking with him. And the example of, of all examples, James could have used a number of examples for you know, a kind of man or woman that prayed. There, there are men and women in the Bible who prayed and who prayed very, very effectively. Uh, Hannah was just one such example. But he talks about the prophet Elijah. And he says in verse 17 that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And James is careful to tell us he's not the super prophet. He's not the super prophet. He has a nature like ours. And when you look at Elijah, he, he could be prone to some very deep discouragement. Very deep discouragement. And yet the Bible calls him a righteous man who prayed fervently and his prayers were effective. Now, it talks about rain here in verse 17. And, and, and I, I've grown up uh, in this country from time to time where uh, there's a drought season and even, even the farmers that don't believe in God are still praying for rain. They're that desperate. They're that desperate. We'll go to a God who we don't think exists, we'll pray for rain. So generally, we are praying for rain. For rain. But verse 17 says that, that Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain. <laughs> it wouldn't. Elijah is praying that God would turn the taps off, so to speak. And, and that expression there that he prayed earnestly could be read this way, he prayed in prayer. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. He fought and he fought and he fought. And he prayed that it would not rain because under uh, Ahab and his, his wife Jezebel, they lead Israel into Baal worship. And if it's going to rain, you know what the nation thinks? Baal's looking after us. Baal's looking after us. And so Elijah prayed that it would not rain. And the scripture says that for three and a half years, for three and a half years, and is, this, is, is Elijah going to the Lord every day saying, Lord, no rain. Day after day, week after week, month after month. So that God could get his people's attention. They could not live in idolatry and have life as usual. They have wonderful crops and green grass and abundant water. If they were going to go, off, go after other gods, then they were going to know what it was like to be thirsty. Thirsty. Because that's how they should have felt spiritually on the inside. It's a God punished by withholding. By withholding. God sometimes does that with us through his chastening hand. He gets our attention by withholding things, withholding things, things that we may really want, things that we may really desire, because if we've made certain things idols, then, then God wants our attention to be upon him. He is a jealous God. He's a consuming fire. And so it's, it's, it's altogether right for God to withhold some things, that we might reorient ourselves to serving him. Elijah prays, 
and then it doesn't rain. And then look at verse 18. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I, I remember, you remember a week or two ago, we got here, in, you know, 50 mils, whatever it was. There was a cyclone through North Queensland a few days ago, and in some parts, 500 mils of rain. 500 mils. And that means the white water rafting is excellent. That's what it means. That's what it means. Yeah. It means you're going to be cutting grass almost every fortnight, maybe, maybe more of those months. God withheld the rain and then he gave abundant rain. And, and the nation knew there was a prophet behind that praying. Elijah, you might say, had a hand in that. He had a hand in that. God was, was withholding and answering because his servant prayed. God does answer prayer. He uses our prayers. He answers and he withholds in response to the prayers of his children. One writer said, history has shown how mankind has, has gone from manpower to horsepower, then to dynamite, TNT, nuclear power. But none of those forms of power move the hand of God. None of those forms of power. And yet the effective prayer of a righteous man avails, avails much. Think about Ephesians 6 after Paul talks about the peace of the Christian armour. All those attributes that God gives as we rely upon him. And he, and he ends that description of the armor with praying always with all prayer. It's the same thought as Elijah, that he prays with prayer. I wonder, are we, are we desperate for God's answers? Are we desperate enough? Or we've ordered our lives to the point where we don't pray. We don't pray fervently because we like it how it is. And, and you know, if, if, if God really were to work an answer, then this would require some changes on our behalf. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man does avail much. In fact, the story of the church would be as much the effective, fervent prayers of godly women. How, how, how many, how many sons have have come back to the faith because of a praying mother or grandmother. Only heaven knows that, friends. Only heaven knows the prayers of a godly mother and grandmother for their children and grandchildren. Only God knows how many of those prayers have been answered. And then in verse 19 today, in verse 19, James tells us to restore. To restore. He says, brethren, brethren. And notice the wording of verse 19. Brethren, if anyone among you. So it's inside the assembly. So about what's happening inside. If anyone among you wanders from the truth. Wanders from the truth. James is admitting the possibility that, that, that any one of us, any one of us can, can wander from the truth. How does that happen? It's when you take little steps, little steps every day in the wrong direction. Little wandering steps away from the truth. It might be listening, listening to unsaved people more than you listen to God's word. Listening, it's often listening to the wrong kind of voices. And bit by bit, day by day, we slowly wander from the truth. And hopefully within the church, there are enough people who, who notice. And who care. They care about others. Care about others. This is not simply one person's job. Believers struggle in wandering from the truth. You don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians. You don't believe me, study the 12, 12 disciples, right? You don't believe me, go back to the Old Testament saints. Yeah? Believers do wander. 
But hopefully there is, there is a, a, a church family that is aware, aware. And James says, someone turns him back. There's, there, there's a person there who picks up the phone or who just encourages them with a word and it's not even a word of condemnation. It's just, brother, sister, I'm, I'm concerned. Maybe that's enough. Maybe that's all that needs to be said. I don't know. You, know, you, may know, you may know exactly what needs to be said, but this is, this is how, what God wants us to do. If you're the one wandering, deep down you would hope that someone would have a word for you. Have a word for you. In Galatians 6, Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. In Hebrews 2, 1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Lest we drift away. Whether pastor, deacon, church member, you name it, we can wander. Scary thought, but it's true. There is that principle of indwelling sin. And we need to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lusts and desires of the flesh. That's the battle. That's the battle. But within the body, hopefully there is a caring, a caring soul that warns, warns. Look at verse number 20. Look at verse number 20. Let him know. So the person that is thinking about helping a wanderer, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Hey, it might be that that person is, not, is lost. Maybe that's the real reason. They're wandering. But verse 20 has this wonderful picture of a soul in grave danger and there being a wonderful, wonderful deliverance. Love covers a multitude of sins, Proverbs 10.12 says. In Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. You know that beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, the peacemakers. It might well be that that verse is really having to do with people that bring others into a relationship of peace with God. It's all about evangelism. Evangelism. Uh, there was an evangelical scholar by the name of F.F. F. Bruce. Now, the name may not ring a bell to most of you. He passed away in 1990. Well over 30 years ago, passed away. But in the, in the second half of the 20th century, Bruce was the man, right? He, he was the writer. He, he was the evangelical. He wrote the books. He defended the faith. He influenced thousands and thousands of students and pastors. Let me read to you what Bruce said at the end of his career. He said... For many years now, the greater part of my time has been devoted to the study and interpretation of the Bible. I regard this as the most worthwhile and rewarding occupation. And then he said this, he said, There is only one form of ministry which I should rate more highly. That is the work of an evangelist to which I have not been called. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Interesting. Uh, yes, we need those in the academy. And we need our authors and writers and commentators. We need, we need them greatly. But there are other things in the kingdom to do as well. And Bruce saw, saw the great need of leading others to Jesus. I came across a, 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 a wonderful account of a, of a, a, a woman missionary, Ch Charlotte... Lottie Diggs Moon. She was born in 1840 in Virginia. 1840 in Virginia. Her family were very wealthy. They had uh, 
great farming crops. They actually lost their wealth after the Civil War, hit the United States. But when her parents had, had money, her and her six siblings uh, were exposed to a lot of education. They got a lot of education. Uh, Lottie knew, listen to this, she knew Greek, Latin, Italian, French, Spanish. When she finished her master's degree, she had a professor called John Broadus. Uh, he, he was the preaching guru of that generation. He was a man everyone read about how to preach. And he, he said of her that she was the best educated woman in the South. That's how well respected Lottie was. Well, this girl had always dreamed of becoming a missionary. A missionary. But, you know, back in those days, woman, single woman, mission field, not easy not easy to do. But her younger sister, her younger sister was accepted by uh, the Southern Baptists to become an intern in China. So her sister Lottie thought, maybe I've got a chance of being a missionary as well. And so she, she applied and they accepted her. They accepted her. But before she went to the mission field, she had to sign a missionary contract. Missionary contract. And in that contract, she, she committed herself to staying in China until either a total breakdown in health or she died. That's what she signed for. It wasn't she got to leave because she didn't get on with the other missionaries. Or she didn't like the particular province she was sent to. She went, either my health breaks or I go to be with the Lord. And she signed, she spent almost 40 years in China. One of those pioneering missionaries. She began a school for girls at first. Only a few came, but it slowly grew, slowly grew. The Chinese didn't appreciate Western missionaries. She was known as the foreign devil. <laughs> she was known as the foreign devil among the Chinese. She went through China during the Boxer Rebellion, where there are many atrocities committed. She, she makes it through there safely. Her sister, by the way, who gets approved first, she does have a breakdown, as many missionaries did. And she goes back to China, but Lottie stays in China. And she would send letters back to the mission board about the needs of missionaries, because to have a breakdown on the mission field was almost, almost part of the course. You became a missionary, you had a breakdown in health, right? I mean, that was, that was what you did. That's what happened because of the conditions. Well, she would, she would write to the mission board and, and, and say, we need to look after our missionaries better. We need to look after them. And you know, because of her advocacy, missionaries got these things called furloughs. We talk about furloughs sometimes. Well, in those days, she was able to have missionaries come home once every 10 years. They got to come back. You know, today, it's every four years, four years. But this is what these people went through. This is what they went through. And I think we need to be reminded of, of these kinds of... Uh, people who really believe what James said when, when those who turn a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Uh, she ended up dying on her way back to the United States in 1912. Uh, her own health broke. Uh, she uh, she shared, her, shared her food with others to the exclusion of her own health and so her own health did break and she died Christmas Eve, 1912. Even to this day, there is an offering taken in her name. So there are, and there are believers like that today as well, just as committed. They may not sign the same papers, but they're committed. They love God. They love others. James talks about that very thing. And if we can't do that here, we're probably not going to do it anywhere else. Yeah, if we can't go after the wanderer and, and reach the lost person in our own postcode, then we're probably not going to go too far with the gospel elsewhere. Let me finish with Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. 
those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever.